title of the message today is uh, The Rise of Judah and a Glance at Christ. The Rise of Judah and a Glance at Christ. Um, we'll be in Genesis chapter 44, we'll consider the entire chapter. Uh, I don't think I've ever done that yet in Genesis. One chapter, all in a week. Uh, that's where we are. Also, again, as I mentioned before, happens to be uh, my by far my favorite section in this portion of uh, Genesis, uh, maybe my favorite section of Genesis, um, if I'm able to dip into the first jump portion of chapter 45, then it's definitely my favorite portion. But this is where we are. So we begin uh, a very rewarding, and I hope, hope it will be rewarding for you, look at uh, what happens here in, uh, in what we commonly know as the Joseph story. Um, though it's really not about Joseph. I want to, before I go any further, just to remind you, this entire section is what has become, right, this toll dot section, these are the generations of, what became of Jacob and the promises that God made him and his family and his children, what happened? And what we find, what happens is Judah happened. Judah happened. God changed Judah. That's what happened. And, um, and God uh, sent Joseph down to Egypt ahead of time to preserve the people. And God was at work in many, many ways. But this is, uh, anyway, here we are. So, again, today we begin to consider this portion of the Joseph story, which is just uh, very remarkable and very rewarding. Um, I have to say, um, it's been wonderful hearing from parents and kids both about how much they're enjoying learning about Joseph and the things that we're bringing out. Um, that's been, that's a thrill. Uh, uh, to hear the conversations that are happening at home and those kinds of things. This is what we're after as, as parents and as a church among our children. Uh, so this has really been good. Um, as much as we've enjoyed these recent chapters and some of us are seeing maybe for the first time how profound a story this really is, uh, all of this is wonderful to witness, but beyond that, and far more important than that, than seeing what's kind of stirring with some of the kids, is um, the knowledge of God and His ways that a greater understanding of these chapters provides us with. It's not just a, a thrilling story. It's not just very interesting. It's not just something we want to talk about. We ought to be deeply learning about God. And for the children, the more they can witness and experience God's Word come alive in vivid detail, and hear God's deeds in gripping reality, the more they will feel instinctively as they grow that the greatest and most captivating and interesting, compelling stories and realities of the world are found in God's Word, revealed in God's book, and that's what we're after. And so for those reasons, this portion that we begin today is uh, thrilling to me to get to teach to through. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount we can learn about uh, repentance, about the new birth, about love, and maybe most of all, in this chapter at least, about the love of the Son of God for His Father. So that's where, we'll, that's where we're going, a glance at Christ. We'll see some parallels here. So with that, I'd like to pray, then we will read the whole chapter and begin our study. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've come now to that portion of our meeting where we invite you through your word to speak directly to us, to teach us, to uh, fix our mind's eye and our gaze upon these truths you've revealed to us, these stories you've told us, that we might be uh, taught, that we might learn, that we might be instructed and changed, and challenged where need be that our hearts and minds would be fixed on the glory of God in the face of Christ. Help us to that end. Help, help us not to waste a word or a moment. We want to receive from you every, every even crumb of truth that's in this text. We know there is life-altering power in your words, and so we ask for that by your Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. I think I will also read uh, through to the the first verse of chapter 45, just so we've gotten to the end of things here a little bit. Genesis chapter 44, and verse 1. Then he, that is Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and put my cup, and the, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we will also, I'm sorry, and we also will be that my Lord's servants. And he said, Let it be as you say, He who is found with it shall be my, my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack, and he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell before him to the ground. And Joseph said to them, what deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, Go up in peace to your father. Then Judah went up to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My, my Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. And then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. And when we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said we cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. Now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant... That is, or for I, for your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. 
For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Then chapter 45, verse 1, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. All right. Well, let's begin then. Chapter 44, verse 1. We have, first of all, in these first two verses, sort of the setup. Um, remember that Joseph had set these men up. He has faith, um, kind of faced them with so much favoritism for Benjamin, right? When they all came down, they brought Benjamin. He's made Benjamin just the absolutely the favorite once again. You know, God be gracious to you, my boy. You know, and then give him five times more food and all of these kinds of things. And it's just, he's laying it on thick so that they are... He is witnessing them as they are seeing favoritism play out among the one who was always the favorite. So it's just another reason to be agitated with Benjamin the way they had been so incensed and hateful toward Joseph when he was the favored son, the favored brother. And then he goes further and gets them all a little drunk. This is all in chapter 43, which we didn't read just now, but gets them all a little drunk. So they're a little bit hazy about everything and that they are in a foul mood in the morning when he wakes them up to send them on their way. Um, And with all of that planned and ready, he now begins the next part of the setup for the final test. And he commands the steward of his house, verse 1, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry. Not as much as they bought. As much as can be carried. Fill them up. Right? Right? And put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, which he did before, last time on their trip, which was a bit of a setup. We'll talk about that in a moment. And put my cup, the silver cup, that one, the one that everyone always remarks about and comments about, right? That amazing cup that's there. And put it in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, that is that same Benjamin who I've been showing favoritism to, with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. Early, so so this happens, I think, early in the morning or perhaps late at night. After the men had fallen asleep, Joseph gives this command. Fill the men's sacks with lots of food. Put the money back again. Put the silver cup in the mouth of the youngest with his his money. And I I want to ask, how would this have appeared to the steward? It's like, again? Perhaps... Perhaps he only saw it as generosity. More food than they paid for. Give them their money back and take that cup and give it to that one that I've been so kind to all this time. And I mean, maybe. I kind of doubt it. But it might have only appeared that way. Just further favoring the youngest. I mean, how, how much did this guy suspect was additional setup? Because initially, it's, this is the extent of the command. No doubt the money was put back in the sack again so that once Benjamin is accused... If the brothers were to return to Canaan without him, it looks again like they've traded a brother for grain somehow. They're kind of kind of stuck in a little bit, in a way. Remember, Joseph is still testing the hearts of his brothers, looking to see if they are indeed changed men. Perhaps all of the money was put back, um, in which case it would appear that they somehow managed to get Simeon and the grain and keep the money all in exchange for some strange situation and they just had to give up Benjamin. I mean, it would appear that way if they came back. They had Simeon, they all had the money, but now we don't have Benjamin. It's like, what, what sort of deals are you making in Egypt with my children, right? You can imagine Jacob, if he were able to speak before he dies. But I don't think... Um, All of the money was put back, personally. I think instead it was the money from the first trip that was put back again. I think they probably likely purchased grain this time, but that initial money that they owed last time, he put back in there to make sure that they kept it. Remember, God had given it back to them. I say that because nothing more is made of that money in their sack later when it's discovered. It just passes over it. Um, So I think that's likely. In that case, 
it would appear that they merely traded Benjamin for Simeon and left him in Egypt. We just got Simeon out, put Benjamin in, and we went back. I think that's how it would appear. I don't think it's likely that he put, you know, double the money back. You know, the money you didn't you got back from last time and the money back from this time. That's a lot of money to get, get put back. Um, that's just my own take on it. But that's, that so far then is the setup. They're going to look guilty. It's going to be bad. So then, verses 3 through 5, we see the final test. It's all, the orders are given. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. And now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. So what do we take, what do we say here? As soon as the morning was light, it says. As soon as the morning was light. Imagine getting the boot at 5.30 a.m. after such an evening as they had had. They're all hung over. It's 5.30. Up, get up, out of the house right now. Whoa, whoa, wait. Wait a minute. It's so bright. Like, go now. Well, we got to pack everything up. It's already been packed. It's ready to go. You have to leave. Now? Can I, can we get some water? Like, go out of the house on your way. It's very strange. It's, it's dis, it seems so disconnected with what they'd experienced the day before. It's startling. It's very rough, kind of harsh treatment again. It would be a shock for certain after such an evening in which they were allowed to enjoy so much at the master's house. And as soon as it says, as they had gone only a short distance from the city, what, maybe a mile or two? I mean, they hadn't gotten far. Joseph sends his steward out to overtake them. No doubt he didn't send the steward by himself, but there's surely an armed escort with him. I mean, you wouldn't, the stewards, they're not just going to just submit to the steward just because he's out there. They're already on their way. Send an armed escort as well to the brothers to overtake them and to accuse them falsely of theft. Now, it's important to remember the steward knows it's a false accusation. He knows he planted the evidence, and now he's been told, go out there and accuse them of this. Not only does he falsely accuse them of theft, he even lies about Joseph's source of wisdom. It's by this, you know, that he practices divination. It's as if Joseph plays into their wonderings, their curiosities, perhaps some of the rumors he knows that fly around Egypt about him and how and his ability to, to know the things that he knows. You took my magic cup, right, is the idea. You repaid evil for good. So, Part of the charge comes from this idea of the Egyptian ruler being betrayed by this theft. He's been so overly kind to them. They've, he's invited them in. He's fed them all these ways. But they have repaid him in this way. And so therefore, this clear word, you have done evil in doing this. Notice also the steward speaks to them. They don't know what he's talking about, but he speaks to them as if you know what I'm talking about. He never mentions the stealing of the cup. Think of this. Up, follow after the men of the city. When you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? And they're thinking, what are you talking about? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination, as though they're supposed to know what they've stolen, which they didn't steal anything. You have done evil in doing this. So they're like, well, you know, I don't know what you're going to find, but... Have a look. So, again, it's hard to imagine what the steward thinks of all that Joseph is doing. Certainly, this would be uncharacteristic for Joseph to do. The steward himself also seems like a fairly righteous man. It must be that his time with Joseph, and there's a lesson for us here, his time that he's spent with Joseph as his servant has convinced him of Joseph's good character. And while what happens right now doesn't make any sense, it seems so out of character for Joseph to ask him to do this. He's going to go ahead right now. Go ahead, bring this charge against these men and bring them back. Knowing that Joseph must intend some righteous purpose in all of this. He's, he's, he's after something. I don't understand it. I don't know what he's doing. It seems totally backwards to do this. These men are going to be put in severe jeopardy if I do this and I bring them back under these charges. But Joseph's done well so far, so I'll do it. 
and he does it. Regardless of what the steward thinks, he obeys, and so we read on. So verse 6 and 7, the whole thing begins now. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words, right? It's just, it doesn't rehash those words. It just says those are the, word, the words he was commanded to speak. He speaks. And they said to him, why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, or look, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks, you could insert last time, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from your, our Lord's house? Right? The brothers collectively respond with disbelief and indignation at being accused of this. They believe that their actions of having returned the money should have cleared them of all suspicion. You should have thought someone else might have taken it, not us. And also that their actions should have put them safely out of harm's reach concerning this accusation. They deny that they even could do such a thing. Now, of course, Joseph knew better. They certainly could do such a thing. They have done such things in the past. He knows they're not guilty of this one, but it's not as if it's just beyond them. Except for Benjamin, we know they've done far worse for silver before. Their protests, of course, are of no use. Imagine them saying, what, how dare you accuse us? But they're speaking to the guy who planted the evidence. Like it doesn't, you can protest and say how innocent you are. It doesn't, it's not going to phase this guy. He knows you're innocent. He's not interested in whether you're guilty or innocent. He's just trying to find the evidence and make you appear guilty. That's his whole purpose. So their protests are of no use. The steward is not here to hear their arguments, but to successfully carry out a setup. And he's not going to stop until he's discovered the planted evidence against them. And he knows exactly who has it. But the brothers continue speaking. Notice um, verse 9. Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die. And we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, let it be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant and the rest of you shall be innocent. It's kind of a confusing, they say one thing, he's like, yeah, like you say, and then he says something different. It's like, wait. So what's going on there? So their final statement here is chilling, I think, in light of what we know. It, it ought to startle you and scare you the same way earlier in Genesis when Jacob said to Laban, you know, whoever you find your, those idols with shall die. And we know Rachel has them. And it's scary, because Rachel might die. She didn't. They didn't find them. But Jacob thought, didn't know that, they were, that someone had taken them. Same way here, his Jacob's sons are unaware that evidence has been planted against them. They all believe that as a group they are completely innocent. And, and they say, foolishly, if you find it in any of our sacks, they don't say, well, if you find it in our sacks, there's, well, there's some explaining to do. I don't know how that would have happened. They just say, if you find it, that one dies, and all the rest of us will be your slaves forever. It's like, yeah, man. it's kind of a rash vow. You know, you don't really, are you sure it's not in your sack before you talked? You're not sure. You'd think they'd have known better to check their sack before they left from the last trip. But they didn't. So here they are. Believing themselves to be innocent, they declare, let that man die who has the cup, and moreover, let us all be your slaves if it is found with us. You cannot imagine that they thought there was the least possible chance of this happening. Or they never would have spoken in this way. But the steward does not consent to what they say. After all, he knows that the goal is to entrap Benjamin with the theft, not the rest. And so he says, okay, that's fine. We'll decide who is guilty based solely on whose possession we find it. What you said is right. Like this, he agrees, he consents so far as to say, look, we'll enter into judgment based on where we find it. But the punishment will be different. So it's like, it's a partial agreement. Like, look, yeah, that's fair enough. Wherever we find it, that's the guilty party. But I'm not trying to make slaves of you all and kill someone. Rather, what? He says, we'll just... 
The punishment will not be as severe as that. The guilty will be a slave and the rest will go free. So now, verse 11. Then each man, this is like a bunch of innocent guys, right? Quickly lowered their sack to the ground. Each man opened his sack. And he, that is the steward, searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. Why did he do that? Why start with the eldest and ending with the youngest? We'll look at that in a second. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. This is a profound picture and demonstrates a massive change in these men. What do we mean? Well, let's, let's understand it here. The brothers all quickly consent to the search and lowered their personal sacks down off their donkeys. And nothing is said of the returned money this time, the m money in the mouth of their sack. Why? Again, I think because it plays no part that it did not play last time. It's there. It still kind of limits their options. They have the money, and they know if they return with the money, then it looks so bad again. Looks like they didn't try to make things right, really, and return it. Something happened this way. Somehow they lost a brother and kept the money again. But think about just from the brother's mindset, they did return the money. And now again it's back. What did they say last time when the money was found in their sacks? God is, we've, we're guilty, right? I mean, we're guilty before God. God's not let us, let us get by with these things. He's going to see to it and make sure that we're punished. For the sins that we've committed against Joseph, it's the same sins against Joseph that's on their mind continually since the beginning of this. And I think they see the money, and it's just the same thing. It's like, God is not letting us go. It's, in fact, the first thing Judah says when he gets to, the, to see Joseph again is, God has found out our guilt. He won't let us escape. We're going to be punished for what we've done. And so... It appears that God has set them up to have, have to deal with trading a brother for silver once again, or with, with it looking that way. You can imagine the men seeing the money in their sacks, fearing that once again, without any knowledge of it, they may have been put into a terrible spot. And one by one, beginning with the oldest, the sacks are searched, but thankfully no cup is found. And so they're dealing with the money, and it's like, really? I've got money in my sack again? What else is in there? Well, it's no cup. We got lucky. Next one. Really? The money's in your sack too? How about a cup? No cup. And it gets down to Benjamin. And you might be tempted to think that the brothers are all thinking each time, see, see, we didn't do it. But it would be terrifying every time to find things in your sack that you didn't put there that made you look guilty last time. And it, you keep thinking, oh, don't be Benjamin. Don't be Benjamin. Not, be don't. And it's Benjamin. It's found in his sack. Oh, the tension that's building up as this is happening. Sack by sack, as brother by brother is, looks guilty, but is cleared of this fatal charge. And then finally, Benjamin, the one that it's found in his sack, and th by their own admission, they said he should die and we'll all be your slaves. It's the one person they vouchsafe for his safety. He will be fine. We'll return him. And that's the one guy now, by their own statement, who deserves death. It's frightening. So, the cup is found. But when that cup is found, man, notice the reaction of these men. They tore their clothes. That is new. Remember when Joseph was sold as a slave? And the men came back with his robe all torn and bloodied and said, Look, recognize, only one person tore their clothes in mourning and anguish. Jacob, Joseph's brothers, they weren't upset about it. What do they care? They're the ones that sold him. But now, these men are so invested in Benjamin. They see themselves... As a, as a family, so much. There's effect, natural affection there to such an extent that when it's found in Benjamin, they tear their clothes in mourning and in anguish. It's an act of anguish. A, it demonstrates emotional upheaval. It's an act of official mourning. They've, they may have lost a brother now. What will they do? So what do they do? They all load their donkeys and return together to the city. 
But that's not what they had to do. They were free to go. The steward told them, this guy's the slave, the rest of you are free to go. But they didn't. They tore their clothes, they took their sacks, loaded their donkeys, and headed south, not north. They, their families are in Canaan starving, needing supplies. They didn't go there. They went back with their brother to Egypt. or They were still in Egypt, but back to the city. They didn't have to do it. What's more than that, we don't see, you might expect to see, who's been seeing some good things about Judah. So maybe, all, maybe the rest of them go, but Judah comes back to the city. No, they all go back. Simeon and Levi and Reuben, even Reuben, all of the brothers, they all go back to the city. It's a wonderful picture. Wonderful scene. Gives us such hints at the changes that have been taking place in the hearts of these brothers. So verse 14. I'll say Joseph then gives every excuse for them to leave Benjamin. When Judah and his brothers, notice the way it's already singling out Judah and highlighting Judah. He's taking the lead among his brothers. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, still early. And they fell before him to the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? So he's still in the setup mode. He's still kind of going along with it. The idea there is, don't you know that a man like me can practice divination? Like, I'm not dependent on just this cup and the oil and water and reading kind of what happens in there. A man like me, I can just flat out practice divination with or without a cup. Did you think that you could take my divining cup, as, it, as people think, and that I somehow wouldn't be able to learn anything or figure out who did it or have this sort of knowledge? Of course I can. Don't you know who I am? And so again, would put the brothers on their heels. And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, that is Joseph said, far be it for me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. What do I want to say here? Well, first of all, even though the brother's earlier suggestion concerning their punishment was rejected by the steward, the brothers do not leave for Canaan as they're free to do. Instead, the sons of Jacob stick to their word and return to the city, even offering themselves as slaves. It is as if they didn't hear the steward rejected their suggestion. I mean, they heard it, but they, they, they just go there and say, we'll be your slaves. And I'm, I kind of look at that and think, uh, wh- like, why? What do you, why? If Benjamin's the one in trouble, like, why you, would you just say, and, and he just has to be a slave, why would you say, well, how about, can we just all be your slaves? That doesn't make sense either. That's a, why do that? Well, my explanation for this is simply that they're, Consciences were absolutely hit hard and bruised at the recent ways that they've not been able to escape what seemed like God's hand in continually confronting them with blood guilt over their former actions against Joseph. To be fair, God was certainly involved, he wasn't, but he wasn't the only one. God was confronting them with that guilt through Joseph. But notice Judah's words here as he speaks on behalf of the brothers. He says, What shall we say to my Lord? God has found out uh, the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. The guilt he's speaking of here is probably not the guilt of stealing the cup. It's the same guilt that they have been discussing for months now, and they have not been able to escape. It's the same guilt they were finally speaking about openly among themselves, discussing their great guilt and the way that God was ensuring that they were going to have to pay for such a crime. They need not identify the distant, long-past crime to the Egyptian ruler 
in order to explain the fact that they had committed some sin that they are now being punished for. They're simply saying that for some unrelated sin, God is punishing them by making them look guilty now. And they cannot plead innocence because all the evidence is against them. Imagine Joseph hearing all of this. The men have been slain by guilt. They are certainly thinking differently about their sins than they had before. And this is a wonderful change to see going on in their hearts. But there's another change that's made in this, this section concerning the suggestion they make about their punishment. And this is curious. I don't know if you noticed it. Remember, initially they said, the one in whose hand you find it will die, and then we'll all be your servants. And the steward said, no, that one will be a servant, and you're all free to go. And they come, and before Joseph can say a word, they, or as soon as Joseph says, why, what is this you've done, like you're guilty, what are we going to do about it? They just say, we'll all be your servants. How about that? So they changed it again. Um, in order to explain this, again, let's we consider their first offer. They had said, Remember, whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servant. I think there is some fear that even though the steward had rejected that suggestion, perhaps this ruler of Egypt, who had once before been very harsh with them, might now be so outraged against them for their theft, he might carry out their suggested punishment and kill Benjamin. There are a number of things happening here. On the one hand, Joseph holds the power of the sword, and he has the authority to do whatever he wishes to them, right? He's in charge. Whatever he says, no matter what it is, it's going to be carried out. But on the other hand, and this was helpful for me to learn this, it opened up this passage to me and what's happening here, is that it was typically done in those times that one party could suggest a form of punishment, and then the other party could suggest a form of punishment. And the magistrate, so you have two parties who are at odds. This person says this should happen. This person says this should happen. The magistrate decides the case, and the punishment, he's kind of free to choose anywhere in between. Like, here's a pull set up, and here's another pull, and I could choose this, or I could choose this, or anything in between. Now, Joseph has the power to choose anything else he wants, too. But typically, it was kind of custom that this was kind of what was done. Is the one party said, look, if I'm guilty, then I, you could do this to me. And the other party says, well, if you're guilty, then this. And tip, I mean, typically it would be the, the offended party, the wronged party, who would out for more vengeance, and the party who's guilty is saying, oh, a light punishment, right? But this is kind of the opposite. They offered the heavy punishment, and the steward said something far lighter. And so Judah comes in, and on behalf of the brothers, he says, look, let, let's, how about we just become servants? He wants to... He's afraid this guy's going to be harsh with them because he's so incensed because it looks like they stole from him. So he immediately tries to move the, the goalposts and say, how about short of killing Benjamin, you just take us all as slaves? And I think the only, that's the only way I can explain his statement because otherwise it's just nonsense. Why would you just go and say, hey, can we just all be your slave? It doesn't make any sense. You try to get Benjamin out or something some other way, but if you think this guy's going to be out for blood, then you're pleading with him Take us all as slaves. Don't just punish one. What a, the severity of the punishment you were going to give the one, spread out among us all and we'll all be your slaves and spare his life. That's the idea. So, these two poles between which it would be common for Joseph to decide between would be the steward's suggestion on the one hand that only the guilty party would be, made, would be made a slave, and the other suggestion from the sons of Jacob uttered hastily when they had thought that there was no chance of their guilt, namely that Benjamin would die and they would all be made slaves. And so this is the question that it will be decided by Joseph. What will the magistrate, what will this man utter? And into that context, Judah speaks up for the men and pleads for a decision to be made that is less than the death they had offered earlier. He offers they would all be made slaves. And I think the, the reason is, the fear is, this, this Egyptian ruler is going to be so angry. And so the idea of just taking the one man as a servant is not likely. Notice they did not suggest, this might have been like them before, you know, we, it's, it's interesting. Well, how would the self-serving person 
deal with this. We, you said, just make this man a slave. And we said, no, kill that man and we'll all be slaves. Judah gets there and one of those propositions he takes away. He says, don't kill him, we'll all be slaves. The selfish man would say, kill him and let us go. Right? But they didn't act that way. They didn't see it that way. Also partly because they know, I think, that escape is futile. Their experience these last few months has been, even when we get away, God still hems us in and makes us deal with the guilt of what we did to Joseph. Just, let's just end it. Let's just surrender and say, okay, whatever the punishment is, just, we'll just deal with it. Because we're not getting out of here. God has found out our guilt is the idea. But of course, the ruler, Joseph, decides in favor of his steward. And so the punishment is as lenient as possible. Only the guilty man will continue as a slave. All the others are free to go. That's the official decision. That is, that is what will happen. That won't be changed. His verdict has been reached and the decision made. Once that happens, the case is decided. This will, in fact, be the punishment. Joseph has devised a way to give the sons of Jacob every reason to leave Benjamin behind. I mean, you might say, well, this, rule, this guy in Egypt, uh, this, this steward of this powerful man has said these are the things that are going to happen to us, but, he, but we haven't talked to, the, to the, the Egyptian ruler himself yet. We're going to plead our case and see if we can change it. Whatever we can do. And it's like, no, this is what's going to happen. You guys get out of here. Go home. He's going to stay. Joseph has figured out a way to give them every reason to leave Benjamin behind. No doubt he was probably surprised to hear Judah speak up on behalf of his brothers and to offer things the way that they did and to confess their deep sense of guilt and the deserved nature of being slaves, that they deserved it. That would be shocking to Joseph to hear that. It must have been very moving for him. And perhaps begins to seem to him like he's finally seeing real evidence that they maybe have changed. But that doesn't deter Joseph. He goes a step further and makes it even more difficult to not leave Benjamin behind. He utters this statement. You can almost see him waiting with bated breath at what his brothers might do in response to this. It appears they have repented hearts, but will they leave Benjamin behind in the face of these new challenges that I've put in your way? He stays. He's my slave. You guys go home. There's just one more closed door to getting Benjamin back home. And we learn that Judah is not content. Judah is in no way content with this. And so Judah seeks a private audience with Joseph. Through an interpreter, no doubt. He's concerned for Benjamin. Judah is. But more than that, he has other matters on his mind concerning his father. And out of love for his father and love for his brother Benjamin, he seeks the opportunity to change the way that the ruler's decision will be carried out. Okay, one of us is going to be a slave. This guy's got to be a slave, but let, let me talk with you. Let me plead with you about some extenuating circumstances, some spe a special case here. Maybe you can change your mind. And so here we pick up in verse 18. Let's read on through verse 29. Then Judah went up to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him. And then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother uh, goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. 
Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs and evil to Sheol. That's the first part of what Judah says. Now, verse 18. Here Judah pleads first for the opportunity to make a special request. Right? What, is, what does he say? Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ear and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. Look, I know you are powerful and you have the power of the sword. And if you get angry with me, I'm a dead man. But that acknowledged, that admitted, that confessed, please let me speak a word to you. You've issued your, you've issued your decree. I understand what you've done. It's been plenty fair. But please let me explain some more things to you that might change your mind on something here. Please give me an opportunity. And he must have been extended, extended the scepter to him or allowed him to come continue on because he does. My Lord, and he begins to recount. All right. Look, this... He's telling the story um, about all their dealings before and all the interactions and things that even that we didn't learn were said before um, were said. We, we get a greater glimpse. Moses gives us a greater glimpse than the fact that the boys even now, even then, had begun to see themselves as something of a family. You notice that. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother's dead. He alone is left of his mother's children. And his father loves him. Why would they say that? I mean, and his father loves him. Or maybe, they just, maybe it was more like, and he's the favorite. Right? Then you said to your servants, Well, bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we learned for the first time, We said to my Lord at that time, Well, the boy cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. They are very aware of how much Jacob loves Benjamin and how fragile he is having lost Joseph to lose this other son, Benjamin, whom he loves, would just kill him. We didn't learn that before as we read until Jacob said those words. But now we're learning that the brothers, they knew that to be the case way back when they were in Egypt before they went to get him. And so we said to my Lord, the boy can't leave his father, right? And then you said to your servants, unless the younger brother comes. So Judah is carefully recounting their previous conversations, underscoring the connection between Benjamin and their father in order to plead special circumstances in Benjamin's case. We have this all the time, right? Someone goes to court, the judge decides a certain punishment, and then an appeal is made for extenuating circumstances. Many times we see this happen when, let's say a man is, let's say he's 75 years old and he's sentenced to 30 years in prison for the crime. Maybe there's a minimum sentence. But it's not a life sentence. And let's say 10 years in, this man comes down with cancer. There's all these life events happening and there's none of his family that he can see. Well, in one sense, he doesn't deserve that. He deserves the 30 years. But the, 30, the judge might look at the case and say the 30 years isn't intended to be a death sentence in prison. It's intended to be a great deterrent. And this man's not a danger anymore. And so he's going to serve the rest of his, maybe more of his time, but we're going to let him out for a brief period to see this family and to see these grandchildren he's never seen. And, to do the, and you just, there's something unique about this case. And you have mercy. A measure of mercy, not full mercy, not, not pardon, but a measure of mercy in this person's case amidst all the punishment. And this is what Judah is pleading. In Judah's mind, the connection between his father and Benjamin is so strong that to take Benjamin away would be to execute the father. And that's not justice. You don't execute the father because of the crimes of his adult son. That wouldn't be justice. And you say, well, I'm not doing anything to him. Well, yeah, but... The nature of his love for this son and the fragility of his health because of his previous, his lifelong mourning is such that he, it will be a death sentence. 
And this is the idea. The way that the father's heart is bound up in the life of this boy is something all of the brothers have known and felt for a long time. It was the atmosphere of the camp and the family of camp and the family of Israel. So the ideas that Judah puts forth in his pleadings are these. I have seven of them. They just kind of follow logically. This is his case. Now, some of what I'm going to say, we're going to read about here in a second. But I just kind of want to do it all at once here. First of all, Benjamin's guilt has been established. Or whether he's guilty or not, it's been established. Second, Benjamin therefore deserves the punishment that he's getting. Perhaps even worse. Third, but he has a father who loves him greatly. And his father has suffered so much having lost another son already that losing this Benjamin would kill him from sorrow. So yes, Benjamin is guilty. Yes, he deserves this punishment, maybe even worse. But there's another person who you're going to punish incidentally. And in the interest of respect and honor, number four, in the interest of respect, honor, and love for that old man, please consider another solution. Five. His father did not allow us to take him here until we made assurances to him of his safety. And in that effort, I offered myself as a pledge of his safe return. Number six, therefore, out of love for my father, and in an effort to keep him alive and not overwhelmed with the sorrow of losing the son that he loves, let me trade places with guilty Benjamin and suffer for his crimes. And let him go free and return him to my father who loves him. Number seven, because, and kind of in summary, how could I go back and see my, have mercy on me. I couldn't bear to go back. Not only would you kill my father, you would crush me. If I were to go back and see my father without having returned for him all his sons, how can I do that? I must return them all to him. Even if it means my own life is lost, I can't bear to see that I bring this upon my dad. So let's keep reading. Verse 30. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? For I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Notice, Remember, recall this, don't forget the mission they were given by Jacob. Go get us a little food, but don't you lose Benjamin. Right? That was the mission. I mean, go get food, but the main objective was don't lose Benjamin. Imagine being Joseph and hearing these direct reports of his father being in a continual state of mourning for having lost him and being so emotionally and physically fragile now that losing another son would kill him. And their brothers are so convinced of this. Judah is so persuaded that this is what would happen to their father. Imagine witnessing his brothers who out of envy had before sought to kill him when he was innocent. Now are pleading with the high rulers of Egypt for the life of what they believe is a guilty brother, perhaps, to trade places with him, that they might not lose him, even though he's favored. And in fact, because he's favored, their love for the Father is such that they're not willing to ever let him go through something like happened with Joseph again. These are changed men. They feel so differently about all of this. Imagine hearing Judah, who had previously thought to sell Joseph into slavery so that the brothers could make some money while ruining his life now offering his own life as a substitute for Jacob's favored son. Imagine Joseph, who was once the only son who cared about doing his father's will at all. Right? Remember that. Again and again, 
he comes out, brings a bad report. Then the time that he's sold, he goes out there. They're not where they're supposed to be. They're doing who knows what. He's the only one who cared about doing his father's will. Now Joseph hears Judah, who's so careful to look out for his father's interests and his father's welfare, who loves his father and is willing to serve his father and obey his father and carry out the will of his father, even at tremendous cost to himself. I'll become a lifelong slave. I'm not going to fail my father. It's incredible. (laughs) Wonderful picture. Imagine Joseph seeing this. Imagine the emotions of hearing Judah willing to offer himself as a slave if only he might save his father's heart by returning to Jacob, the son that Jacob feared would be lost. How must this have landed upon the heart of Joseph now witnessing such radically changed men, especially Judah? It is as if Judah is just as interested as keeping the family safe and together as Joseph has been. It's incredible. And we don't have to just imagine verse four, chapter 45, verse 1. Skipping ahead here. The next chapter. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. When you read this scene, you shouldn't read it coldly. You should be as impressed and amazed as Joseph. He responds to this. This is the climax of the whole story. It's a, a, right up to that point, it builds and it just now it all breaks and you have this watershed moment. Literally watershed. As Joseph just bursts into tears, he can't control himself anymore. And he weeps loudly. When you he, see the things that, is ha, that, that Judah is saying, you hear what he's saying, you realize all that's taking place for him to get to this place and plead the way he's pleading, you ought to be as moved it, you ought to understand why Joseph was so easily moved, and you ought to be moved yourself. Now, we've gone through the chapter, and I want to conclude and make some applications, and there are three pages of that, right? Because there's a lot here. Beloved, when you look at Judah and the enormity of his actions in this chapter and in the last, I believe a number of motives stand out. First, there is... Three motives. There's the desire to save and deliver his brothers and sisters and the whole of the family. They need food. They need food. And so he goes and he risks so much to go save everyone, to preserve them. And we also see, and Ben, Benjamin needs deliverance. He's in trouble. And that doesn't phase Judah. He goes on. That's one motive, to save his brothers and his sisters, and all their families. We need food. It's a great risk. We're going to do it. Oh, man, Benjamin's in trouble. We'll do what we have to to save him. That's one motive. To save them. Two, there is his desire to bring harmony to his family, probably for the first time. He wants to bring them all back safely together to Jacob in the promised land. He wants to end the the months and the years of accusations and second-guessing and all that's going on at the camp at Canaan. And as a result of all that, all that he's experienced and the way that his guilty conscience is plaguing him, and more importantly, as a result of a changed heart that finally loves righteousness and hates sin, he cannot bear the thought of abandoning another of his brothers and creating all this havoc again in the family. And so he offers himself, says, take me. Like, I, I, won't get, I won't experience all that, but I'll know that I've secured for my family unity, harmony, love. I want that for them. That's his second motive. Third, there is his great love for his father. Remember, it wasn't long ago, a few chapters ago we read, Judah left the family. He went off to another place in Canaan and just made his life there. And it was only through a profound embarrassment in the public sphere concerning his sins and this so-called prostitute's righteousness that he repented of his sin. He saw the error of his ways. He went back home, began to make things right. And now he's a radically changed man, and he loves his father. And this one, I think, in this chapter stands out the most. If you just listen to Judah's words, his great motivation is his love for his father. That's paramount 
For how could I go back and see the evil that would befall my father? For the first time, Judah has risen to heights in terms of righteousness and morality and godliness and love that we've not seen before in any of the sons of Jacob, not even Joseph. Joseph has been for us in all these situations a model of righteousness. But this demonstration of self-sacrifice and love is higher than we've seen from Joseph. I'm not saying Joseph would never have done that. I don't mean that. I just mean we haven't seen something this high yet from Joseph. It's incredible. For all of Joseph's wonderful attributes and his godliness, he's not willingly offered himself as a substitute for his brothers for the sake of his father. And having come to this position, Judah readily offers himself as a lifelong slave in Egypt, losing all that awaited him and his family in the land in order to follow through in love for his father. Look at verse 33 and 34 and consider the logic. There's these logical words. Now therefore, right? Because this is the situation with my dad and he's so bound up with Benjamin. Therefore, please, please let your servant remain instead. For, verse 34, for how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? For I feared to see the evil that would find my father. What a sacrifice, beloved. What an act of love for his father. What a change in Judah. And beloved, let's learn something about our Savior in all of this. This is where it just it becomes so clear to make the connection. The very things that are so moving and so incredible about Judah in this chapter are just as true and are even more magnificent in the heart of our Savior and our brother, Jesus Christ. Consider the Lord Jesus Christ and His desire to save and deliver His brothers and sisters and the whole family, to save them. Right? Judah sought to preserve the life of his family, so he went on a long journey to give them what they did not have, that they might survive. Well, Jesus sought to preserve His people and to provide for them an eternal home with God. And to do this, He obtained for us every good and perfect gift and all things pertaining to life and godliness that He might freely give them to us that we might have what we need for an eternal life. Judah sought to save his brother Benjamin from the punishment he thought he deserved. In order to save him, he offered himself as a substitute in the legal place of his brother. <laughs> well, Jesus sought to deliver us from a deserved and a real condemnation. In order to do this, he offered his own life as the God-man in order to satisfy the demands of his righteous character, yet free us from the condemnation which we had earned. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why He came, to save. Just like the same reason Judah came to Egypt this time, to save His family. So Jesus came to save sinners. Consider His desire to bring harmony to His family for the first time. Well, Jesus came to a humanity that had only known partial and temporary peace at best, if any peace at all. He came to a world that had been murdering since Cain, betraying since the garden, and arguing since the fall. He brought with Him to that world a life of service and love as an example. He gave His disciples a new command, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He gives new hearts, fills them with love for each other and for Him. He is making for peace in the family. He does it. It's incredible. Consider, lastly, His love for the Father. And this is where I think things become crystal clear. Our captain, our Lord, our great brother, offered Himself as a substitute because a substitute was needed. And in love for His Father, He went all the way to the end. Think of his devotion and of all that he was willing to do to rescue from death those that his father loves. Right? 
Beloved, this is a fundamental part of all that was happening in the life of our Lord. Does Jesus love us? Yes, He loves us. But He wasn't just out there because He loves us. I mean, we could in one sense say, well, that would be enough. But that's not all that Scripture gives us. Yes, He went to the cross in love for you and I, but don't miss this either. Jesus Christ was a faithful Son whose heart was filled with love for His Father, whose great desire was to restore to His Father all that was lost and to not fail Him where every other person had continually, only, ever, always failed Him. John chapter 6. Just a couple of verses I want to look at on these things, and we'll move on. John chapter 6, verses 37 through 39. John 6, 37 says this, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. That's why I'm here. Because my dad sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. The reason I'm down here saying the things I'm saying, doing the things I'm doing, and will do what I'm going to do is because I'm not here just because I want to, but there's, I'm concerned about His will and His desire. And His great desire is that I would speak words that when believed, people would be saved, that none of these precious ones who He's given to me, who's entrusted to my care, to be the one to save them, to have that obligation and responsibility, I'm not willing to lose any of them. I will raise them up on the last day. That sounds so familiar, doesn't it? To Judah, it was what we just read. John chapter 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, right, it's time, it's almost over, I'm going to go back and return to Him, having accomplished whatever it is I'm going to accomplish. Time is near. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. He didn't quit. One other text from the Old Testament. And there's so much that we could have read. I had several chapters I thought I would be wonderful to read, but I just want to read three verses. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10, 11, and 12. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. Don't miss this verse. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He's going to serve his father well. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall, it's going to be hard, but out of that anguish he shall see and he shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. And therefore, what does God do? Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You see him carrying out faithfully the will of His Father. There's a, there are many prophecies and pictures that the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene and fulfills. One of those pictures that, we don't use, that is well known, but we don't often think about, is this picture of the suffering servant. We just don't usually, we make the connection, we understand, oh yeah, He's a suffering servant of Isaiah. But think of that just for a moment. I'm talking about a man coming to faithfully carry out the will of his Father because he loves Him, no matter how hard it is. And we're talking about Jesus as the suffering servant. Like Judah had volunteered to be here. I'll suffer in service to my Father. Jesus did it in a way that's so more magnificent than what Judah ever even dreamed of. Imagine, beloved, also, think of this, the great love of God the Father for us. He sent His own Son here into the midst of a lost and sin-ravaged world to offer His life as a substitute for us and to teach us about the Father's love and to show us the way back to God and to be that way Himself. He came to restore to His Father those lost sons and daughters 
You see? Jesus had, a, had, a, had heard something from his father before. Don't lose the Benjamins. Don't lose those sons and daughters of mine. And he came to not lose us, to save us, to bring us back to the father. And I just say, just as Judah said, could say, think of his words, the, my father's heart is bound, his life is bound up in the life of the child. And I say, what would motivate the Lord Jesus Christ to go through what He went through for us? Well, we common say, commonly say, well, His love for us. And I say, yes. But also His perfect knowledge of His Father's heart. And His desire to serve and to, to faithfully do all that was in the Father's heart to have done for us, to carry it out. And so Jesus can say there that night, like, He can know the Father's heart is bound up, His life is bound up in the life of these people of His. He couldn't bear to lose them. And this is what we see. He didn't do it on His own. He was sent by His Father to rescue those that His Father loved. And so there's a sense in which the entire act of redemption, all the work of God the Son as a man, is simply one great act of love and devotion to His Father. It is painful it is costly, it's a long road of suffering and hardship, but it is a path that He trod in love for His Father. For the joy of seeing the heart of His Father rejoice at the accomplishment in view that men and women and children who are created in God's image might be restored to God in love and in righteousness. Think of this, as the Son contemplated and thought about the will of His Father, he could not see any way that God the Father would be satisfied apart from saving sinners through the cross. Judah himself, in our story, had a mission. Get food, but don't lose Benjamin. And Jesus has a mission. Don't lose any of the people I give you. I love them with an everlasting love. They are precious to me. Don't lose them. Save them all. I can't bear to lose even one. And the son says, All right, Father, I won't lose any. It is the loving work of Jesus Christ, not merely to forgive you of your sins. We tend to think, and not, we're not wrong in this, there's a great personal nature of salvation. We tend to think of our being saved as something God just does for us. And then it is that. But it's not just that. I mean, think of this. We, there's texts in Ephesians that tell us that the Father gave to the Son as an inheritance us. It's like part of His delight is to get us back to Himself and have fellowship. But it's the same way the Son redeemed for the Father these sinners, us. That God might have us back in right relationship. He's going to restore to the Father not even just sinners, but a whole creation to take all that has been lost and to restore it all. To once again make God all in all. And what is further, to make Him all the joy and the very heartbeat of humanity. And this is the thing we witness in dim comparison in Judah's rise among the sons of Israel. We see not just Judah in his righteousness, but we get a glimpse of of Christ. And that's the reason, right? We, the message, the rise of Judah and a glance at Christ. You see, there, think of this now, there in that Egyptian hall, before the seat of Egyptian power and authority, Judah has become a lion. He's become an Aslan, right there. It's wonderful. There on that stone floor in Joseph's palace, prostrate face down on the ground before the great ruler of Egypt, pleading with the man, take me instead. My dear dad couldn't have it any other way. If one of us must stay, if it has to be, take me. Take me. Let Ben go home to our father. If I fail dad here, it will end the very heartbeat of my dad. I cannot bear it. Whatever it costs me now, I will I'll lose whatever I have to. I cannot fail my dad in this way. I love him too much. 
If I give my life to keep that from happening to him, then I give my life. What a change. What a man this Judah has become. And Judah then, in this very act, cements his rightful place of leadership among the family. You would have thought that Joseph would be the one. The tri- one of the tribes of Joseph. The, root, the scepter shall not pass from that. But it's Judah. Nothing, nobody's like Judah. Look what he's done. Beloved, our Lord did this same very thing, but on a higher plane and on a deeper level than you or I could ever imagine. One preacher, one of my favorite preachers, <laughs> mused this way. When all of this happens between Judah and Joseph and the angels of heaven witness it, think of this, you can almost hear the angels whispering as rumbling perhaps begin about the coming mission of the Son of God on earth. Do you see that? Do you see what Judah did? Do you think that maybe when Jesus comes, it might, that maybe it would be like that? Do you think it would be something like this? Well, that's what the man said. And I thought, thinking about it a little more, and I said, you know, to their great surprise, almost 2,000 years later, one of these angels, perhaps, sent by God the Father to strengthen the Son on the night before of His great sacrifice, right? We know an angel came to strengthen Him. As the angel arrives in the garden that moonlit night, he hears the words of Jesus while he's spread out on the stone courtyard in the garden in agony, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood and pleading with God, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Right? It doesn't matter how great the cost to me. I'll not fail to bring them safely home to you, my Father. Your love for them is too great. Your sorrow for me, if I were to fail, too great to bear. I love you, Father. I won't fail you. Your will be done. And so to the cross he goes, bearing the sins of all God's people. As a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he spoke not a word of objection, not a word of resistance, until he finally could say with confidence and satisfaction, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit commit my spirit. Beloved, the application for you and me is twofold. Number one, to realize and appreciate the tremendous love of Jesus Christ for the Father. Among the stories of this world throughout history, it's almost an unspoken assumption that great men and great deeds should be imitated and followed as much as possible. You hear some great story, it's told to produce in you something of the same kind of thing. I would simply say this, if someone like Jesus loves the Father that much, how ought you and I to live for and love this same God as well? Right? Jesus is the greatest demonstration of love and devotion and loyalty that has ever been witnessed on earth or in heaven. When I consider the life of Jesus in this way, in terms of His devotion to the Father, it makes me want to follow Him in love both for people but most of all for God. I I want to be devoted like He's devoted. When you see it, let us follow Him who is our Master and Savior and Lord. That's one application. The second application is this. To recognize the truth, beloved, of that phrase and the rightness of it. Beloved. Beloved. You who are loved. As the Son looks to the Father and knows His Father's heart, He looks upon that heart and realizes that the only outcome that will satisfy His Father is to get us back into right relationship with His Father, with sin out of the way, with sorrow and pain gone forever. Let's quote Scripture here. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? But for this purpose I've come to this hour. This is why I'm here. right? The Son knows the great love of the Father for sinners. And the Son Himself has great love for the Father. Right? So the Son looks at the Father, forgetting His own desires now, because that's what He said over and over again. I'm not worried about my own will. 
I look at my father and I see he has great love for these sinners. And they're lost now. But I could do something. I could take their place and save them. And I could restore his heart. I could give him joy. And he does it. Out of love for his father. And I just say, the Lord's not mistaken when he sees what's in the heart of his father. Which tells me, it ought to show you something of how great the father's love is that Jesus recognizes for us. Do you see this? The father realizes he wouldn't be satisfied if I even... What if I saved most of them? That's not good enough. It would crush me to lose even one who I mean to make a, an eternal son of God. Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice. He's raised from the dead. Exalted to the right hand of the father. And is building a kingdom. And one day the joy returns, beloved, in full measure. And the Father's heart is revived fully. And the dwelling place of God is once again with men. It's incredible. And I just say we get a glimpse of this. when we, we get a glimpse of the Lord Jesus Christ when we see what Judah is doing for his Father. And it is stirring. It's wonderful. I hope, again, as we read the story, that we're, yeah, I want us to see the, how profound the story is and how great the change and all that's going on in Judah but it speaks to us about something greater that the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And that's where I hope the application is that we see that. And we're gripped by it. And we think differently about all that God has done for us in Christ. Now, next week, chapter 45, we begin there. And there we get a whole different view. Now we see it from Joseph's perspective, the one who, rede who wants to welcome them in and redeem them, to provide for them, to save them. To bring them to himself who has all the power and everything. To give them freely now. And that's where we are next time. Well, beloved. Amen. Any comments or questions on the thing?